What is the parent's dream? If I ask you to choose two words describing the parent's dream, I believe most of you would say, Elsie Child. When we draw our cell phone, showing pictures of a successful child, as a matter of fact, we speak about ourselves. Because who made him? Is the extension of our own ego. Our second child was born 1984. We gave him the name of my brother that was killed in the war and expected him to be better than us, more successful, more talented, a source of pride. At the age of eight months, he was diagnosed, and Didi, my wife, and me were told by the psychologist, your son is having a combination of autism and retardation. Probably, he will never speak. Probably, he will mentally stay child forever. That was a shock. The sky fell on our head. The parent dream became broken parent dream. How we continue managing our life if our son has no future at all? This son, all his life, has never said one word. Never said Abba, Dad. Never said Ima, Mom. Never made eye contact. And he was the greatest professor of my life. He taught me. He taught me more than any other human being about myself, about our society, about children like him. These children, unable to eat by themselves, unable to dress by themselves, even unable to say, please replace my diaper. These children are punished for two life sentences. One, broken body for all their life. And second, one day being taken and put in institute, which is a full life jail. When he was born, at that time, I was Special Force Unit Commander, 33 years old, Lieutenant Colonel, leading operations in Sudan to bring Jews who were in life danger from Ethiopia to the State of Israel, the only Jewish state in the world. Behind me were hundreds of battles all over the Middle East, in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, and more. Behind me was the very famous rescue operation in Entebbe, 1976, rescuing 105 Israeli hostages who were kept one week, one week of their life hostage. I was the first on the ground. I was the first on the ground and the last to leave the Entebbe airfield. And behind me were the memories of the Yom Kippur War, 1973. In this war, I lost many of my friends. In many moments, I thought I won't see the next morning. But above all, the memories of the telephone conversation with my mother at the end of that war. My brother, fought in the Golanites, I fought in the South, and I was afraid to ask. Then I got the courage, and she said, we lost Iran. We have no Iran anymore. My brother was killed. I came home, continued to the Golanite to investigate his last battle. I found his burnt tank, and shockingly, I learned to know that he was shot by a Syrian tank, thrown outside, Bleeding, pleading, shouting for assistance, seven days. He was evacuated, dead already. 
I was rageous, frustrated, angry, and I swore. I swore to never, ever leave a wounded soldier behind. <laughs> Eleven years later, Didi, my wife, and me, raising a child who is like the extension of my bleeding brother. And this child, like saying, my dear father, you know a lot about special forces. You know a lot about highly motivated soldiers. But my dear father, you know zero about children like me, about the shame, the stigma, the stereotype. Come over, my dear father. Give me your hand. Let's go. Let's move and see places where children like me are hold. And we moved from institute to institute. We saw dirty, stinky, dark places. Children like him were ignored, abused, harassed. We came home crying. And then we started learning about the shame. For instance, Golda Meir, our commander-in-chief during the Yom Kippur in the 70s, the one who sent me and my friends to hunt down the terrorists behind the Munich massacre of 11 Israeli sportsmen, 1972. Golda Meir was also a grandmother to Meira, a Down syndrome granddaughter. And Meira told the Israeli public after Golda passing, Golda never visited me. Golda didn't love me. Golda was fully ashamed on my presence. Golda told my mom to never mention the Prime Minister of Israel having retarded granddaughter. And then we heard more stories of distinguished and ordinary people hiding their children overseas and in some institute in Israel. And inside me, I continue hearing the sound of my child. My dear father, wake up. I'm the hostage in our society, unable to do anything by my power. Will you fight for me? Will you change our society? Will you give me a hope? And we decided to fight for him. We decided to love him. Never to be ashamed. For him, and like him, we built a village. A wonderful place. A paradise. Not anymore. Isolated institute, surrounded by walls of silence, but rather social community center. A paradise, utopian society, Christians, Muslims, and Jews walking in full harmony to serve children like our loved son, <laughs> to love them. In this village, we give them the best housing, the best education, the best health care, the best food, the best clothes, the best social life, culture, music, gardens, any need. And in this village, we created a new model of acceptance, a new model of integration. How come? By four elements. Number one, rehabilitation. Number two, education. Number three, visit. And number four, volunteers. The rehabilitation model, based on every day, about 200 outpatients from the outside community arriving to be treated together with the most severely disabled children like our loved son. Metaphorically and physically, it says that at the same swimming pool, you may find a soldier wounded in battle, head of regional municipality after stroke, parliament member after road accident, Down syndrome, Bedouin girl, and someone like our loved child. We give them various kinds of 
therapeutic treatment like hydrotherapy, physiotherapy, music therapy, horse riding, animal therapy, vocational therapy, any, th any therapy ever invented, we have there. The second element, education. At the center of the rehabilitation center, we placed ordinary kindergarten for ordinary kids from age one. We teach children from age one to accept those who are unable, those who are unprivileged, the severely disabled. We teach them what is social responsibility from age one. And the third element, visits. Every day, 100 people, about 100 people arriving to visit, to see the wonder. They are moved, they are excited. People from United States and Europe, tourists, high-tech workers, soldiers, veterans, parents, people arriving and saying, we got proportion. We'll assist you to change our society. We are your messengers. And number four, volunteers. We have more than 400 volunteers. Some of them arriving from Germany. And this Christian, young Christian from Berlin, saying, we come for atonement on the murder of the six million Jews in Second World War. We come for atonement on Hitler's decision to kill the disabled when Second World War started. They are saying, no more discrimination, no more racism. Human being is human being. We all equal by our rights, not equal by our power. And they are very well integrated with about 100 Muslim workers, Bedouin from the south, with about 600 Jews to serve the severely disabled children. And they are saying we are more given than giving. We'll assist you to change the world. We'll assist you by being your ambassadors. Tonight, exactly tonight, February 6th, we count 10 years for the passing of our loved child. He's not anymore with us. He was living one wonderful year in the village that we built specially for him. His spirit spread to every corner of the village. His spirit is here at my heart. His spirit is the goodness in our world. Fourteen years ago, I left the military as Major General for building this village, for being his mouthpiece, for changing our society, for continue fighting for him and like him until my last day. A year ago, I was decorated by the highest award the State of Israel can give to a citizen. The Israel Prize for Lifetime Achievement. This prize, this prize should be given to him, not to me. I'm only the messenger. He changed me. He made me a better human being, more humble, less selfish, less arrogant. If the number of children like him is only 1% from world population, this 1% can change the 99%. This 1% can be the teacher and educator the same as he was for me. This 1% can make the 99% more humble, less selfish, less arrogant.
The social chain is always measured by its weakest link. The more we do to strengthen this link, the better and stronger society we are. In military, we decorate people and soldiers for bravery and courage. In our social life, it seems to me the highest decoration a person can be given by the disabled, by the 1% children like him, is the title human being. Thank you.